So our next speaker is Taylor Shedd. Taylor's love for the ocean has taken him to the University of Hawaii and around the world working for Seamaster before coming here to Scripps. Upon graduating, Taylor will work as the program coordinator for Soundwatch in Friday Harbor, Washington, monitoring and researching the impacts of vessel traffic on marine wildlife and advising management on best practices, which is kind of amazing. Uh, when Taylor got here, all so Taylor to killer whales is like natty to sea turtles. <laughs> kind of just fixated. He doesn't, you don't wear an actual killer whale necklace, but I wouldn't be surprised if you did, right? It's, he really cares a lot about um, killer whales. He has always been fascinated with the Pacific Northwest. And so the fact that he was able to find a job that will, you know, bring together those two things for him, I think it's just such a fantastic opportunity. And I'm so happy that he was able to, to find it. I also want to announce that we Taylor and I are about to be friends. <laughs> Since Taylor started the program, he has been saying that he wanted to be friends, and I have said, you know, we can't, right? I am, I'm the teacher, right? Like, we can't be friends. This is a professional relationship. I broke my hand in a bike accident. He was the only person besides my kids who signed my cast. Um, <laughs> And I always told him that after Scripps Day, we could be friends. So Scripps Day is on Friday, for those of you who can make it. And I guess that friendship is impending. So <laughs> please join me in welcoming Taylor Shedd. Also, first, I'd like to admit I was the one who came up with the hedgehog idea. <laughs> But good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Samantha, for the lovely introduction. All of you that have been here throughout the day, you're amazing. Those of you who showed up for the free drinks afterwards, thank you. Um, my presentation is called A New Perspective, Characterizing the Foraging Behavior of Endangered Southern Resident Killer Whales from New Heights. Um, again, thank you guys so much. I know that I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for this guy. And I'm actually talking about the whale. If you don't know what this is, this is from the movie Free Willy. I grew up watching this movie on repeat until I wore out the VCR. Yes, I grew up when there were VCRs. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't actually heard of this movie, it's a harrowing tale of a captive whale being released into the wild. Eventually, I learned that this whale that was played by Free Willy, his name was actually Keiko, and he never really became free, like the movie portrayed. With a bit of movie magic and... Um, with a bit of movie magic, the scenes of Free Willy in the wild were actually these whales, the southern residents. I found out that the southern residents are a unique population of killer whales because they spend most of their summer months in the inland waters of Washington State and British Columbia, where they feed almost exclusively on salmon. Unfortunately, I heard a sad story about this population as well. The southern residents were the original targets of marine parks for live capture. Young females were especially targeted to be shipped around the world to be put on display for enter entertainment. One of the first whales ever captured in the area actually became the most famous whale, Shamu, who was actually sent here to San Diego where she spent the rest of her life. The live capture fishery of killer whales in Washington state ended in 1976 after 45 individuals had been removed from the southern resident population. Today, the population has still never fully recovered from their estimated 200 individual pre-exploitation numbers, but the southern, southern residents are facing new threats. In 2005, the southern residents were listed under the Endangered Species Act as a distinct population, the first of any killer whales in the world. Three main factors were listed as threats to the population, prey availability, contamination, and vessel traffic with its associated noise pollution. Recently, as the population hovers around 76 individuals, low prey, avail low prey availability has come to the forefront of the effort to protect the southern residents. In the past, low prey availability has been examined through the diet and foraging behavior of the southern residents through fecal analysis. Fecal analysis is important because we can learn about what goes into the whales by what comes out of the whales. From these samples, scientists can collect scales, bones, hormones, tissue samples, et cetera, so we can get a basic understanding of these killer whales foraging habits. From these studies, it was estimated that 90% of the southern residents' diet is Chinook salmon, particularly stocked from the Fraser River watershed in British Columbia. Scientists would drive their boats closely behind whales and hope to catch some data in their nets. 
we got a little more advanced and we actually trained some dogs to smell data on the water. <laughs> Scientists are now exploring the use of drone technology for research applications. Researchers at NOAA first utilized this technology to study body condition of whales. High resolution vertical images taken from the drone allow for photogrammic techniques to be used. Photogrammetry is the science of calculating measurements from images. So researchers were able to calculate the overall length, width, which allowed them to estimate the weight and body condition of the whales from these images. These images unveiled, unveiled a new perspective into the life and behavior of these whales. So for my capstone project, I utilized this data set opportunistically to directly observe the whale's foraging behavior versus indirectly through fecal analysis. I partnered with these researchers at NOAA and decided to see if we could use this technology to better understand the foraging behavior of the southern residents. The research objectives for my study were to one, measure and estimate the le real length of fish preyed upon. This was a gap in our knowledge unattainable from fecal studies due to the fact that fecal analysis could not reveal much information about the fish before the foraging event. Two, to identify the species of fish preyed upon. This could also be a gap in our knowledge due to the simple fact that only fish that were captured by the whales would be represented in the fecal studies, and those fish preyed upon but never captured or rarely captured may be missing. Three, I uh, wanted to identify the composition of whale groups involved in foraging. This is an observational data set that can be difficult to collect from vessel-based platforms, but the vertical images allow us to accurately see the individual whales participating in foraging events. Lastly, to assess the extent of prey sharing behavior between individual whales. Prey sharing has been observed in many species of dolphins, including the southern residents, but the extent of the sharing behavior has only been hypothesized to this point. What indiv individuals participate in prey sharing? Are individuals being sustained by others through this prey sharing behavior? To collect these images and the data, a hexacopter drone, which I codenamed Whale Force One, was used. The drone was equipped with a pressure altimeter, which I'll explain its importance a little bit later, and the camera would be facing downwards to capture flat images without distortion near the edge. This was important for the photogrammetry techniques. I'll explain a bit later. Uh, the drone was launched at sea from a small research vessel and flown over the whales at an altitude of 30 meters. The goal of the original body condition study was to fly over every member of the southern residents during each collection effort. So the whales so whales or groups of whales were not targeted for their behavior or suspicion of foraging. This allowed for a large cross-section um, sample through the population, but possibly limited my data analysis. Over 20,000 images were captured over the five individual month-long collection efforts in May and September over the last three years. I sorted through every single image and pulled out foraging events. A foraging event was defined as a set of images that contained a fish and a whale within the same frame. A total of 29 events were observed over the five collection efforts. After all these images had been inspected for foraging behavior um, and placed into distinct events, each event was then reviewed again and classified by the types of foraging behavior observed. Fish chasing, fish in mouth, a capture event, and prey sharing. A fish chase behavior was assigned when whales were and were observed chasing a fish. This was clearly apparent by whales chasing fish. <laughs> also by changes in speed, direction, cooperative hunting, or surface behaviors like tail slapping. Fish and mouth behavior was assigned when there was a clear presence of a fish or parts of a fish in a whale's mouth. If chasing and fish and mouth behavior was observed within the same event, it was considered a full capture event. Prey sharing behavior was assigned when the presence of passing fish between whales or the dropping of a fish or parts of a fish to be picked up by another was apparent. These high resolution images captured by the drone were detailed enough for us to use these photogrammic techniques on. The image on the left is uncropped and unedited, whereas the image on the right is a zoomed in section of the original. The high resolution image allows us to make detailed observations such as the individual identification of the killer whales. So for my first research of objective, it was to measure and estimate the real length of fish preyed upon by the killer whales. To do this, I selected an image from each foraging event in which the fish was in a linear or straight line to obtain the most accurate measurement. I utilized a photogrammetry software called ImageJ, which would 
measure the pixel length of the fish. I would then convert pixel length into real length of meters, knowing the altitude of the drone when the image was taken and the focal length of the camera. This is where the importance of the altimeter comes into play. This graph displays the average length of fish per collection effort. Firstly, one can notice that there were zero measurable fish from May 2017. There was one foraging event collected during this effort, but the fish was not whole when the images were taken. Uh, we can see that the average length of total fish was 0.76 meters, with the shortest average being collected in September 2015 at 0.54 meters, and the longest average in September 2017 at 0.76 meters. That's an almost a 0.2 meter difference in the average size of fish over the course of this study. Um, the black bars represent the range of fish size in the collection efforts, um, and this difference in size may be due to the killer whales actively selecting larger fish to forage on, or maybe that the fish were truly smaller in 2015. This graph displays the average length of fish poor foraging category. We can see here that the shortest average length of fish is in the chasing category, whereas the longest average fish is seen in capture events and fish and mouth events. This additionally suggests that killer whales are actively selecting larger fish to prey upon. Um, this, or the hypothesis behind this is that one large fish has more benefit to the whales than multiple smaller fish. Another interpretation of this data is that the smaller fish observed in chasing events are due to young calves that may be practicing their foraging events. However, this is kind of contradicted by the largest fish being observed in this study was a chase event by a calf. As seen from the range bars, another hypothesis for observing uh, smaller fish in chasing events is that the fish are actually different species. Um, of fish that are generally smaller than the preferred Chinook salmon. This leads to my second uh, research objective was actually species identification of the fish. To accomplish this, the images that were, uh, no, I'm sorry. yeah, thank you, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> she held up zero. Um, <laughs> species of fish. <laughs> to accomplish this, the image that best displayed the fish from each event was examined for distinguishing characteristics of species identification, such as body shape, head morphology, fin margins, etc. I collaborated with an expert in the field, Dr. Jeff Hard from NOAA's Northwest Fishery Science Center, who analyzed the images and gave his personal confidence level for each fish identification. This graph shows the species identification by confidence level. Um, in that identification. One can clearly see that the greatest number of high confidence identifications were actually Chinook salmon. The second was steelhead, which is still a salmonoid species. Um, these results support that of the fecal study in that greater than 90% of the southern residents' foraging efforts were identified uh, to be Chinook salmon. But this also suggests that maybe other species are important as an alternative food source to this population, such as steelhead and coho. My final two objectives were to identify the composition of whale groups involved in foraging and assess the extent of prey sharing behavior between individuals. These two objectives can kind of be answered in the same, at the same time. Almost half of all the individual southern residents were observed in foraging behaviors in this study, but most of the whales, with, but most of the whales were only observed once, which does not allow for a complete analysis of the composition of whale groups involved in foraging, since I didn't actually have replicates um, within the study of the same individual. This can be something that can be targeted in hopefully future studies. Um, but a killer whale pod is constructed of associating matrilines. Offspring remain with their mothers throughout life, so pods are organized as a matriarchal society, sort of like a royal family. The life history and census of the southern residents has been maintained by researchers since 1960. This allowed for me to achieve these actually two objectives. So in foraging events, an average of two whales participated in chase events, but an average of 2.8 and a median of three whales participated in sharing events. This suggests that more whales participated in sharing events than chasing events and capture events. This was observed mainly to be young calves again that were not involved in the chasing but were shared with by related members of the pod. 88% of all of the foraging events contained prey, prey sharing behavior. And of the 22 events that did not have prey sharing in them, most of those were actually single individual whales. 
Sharing behavior was seen across a wide range of whales and relationships between whales. We had cousins to cousins, great grandmothers to great grandnieces, and everything in between. Of the prey sharing, 62.5% were between members of the same matriline or direct relationship. Of the direct relationship prey sharing, 76% were between mothers and calves. There were only two events observed where sharing occurred between members outside of the same matriline or direct relationship. One of these was between two sisters and uh, a male from another pod, which is a common mating behavior of these resident whales, where males will leave their home pod to join another for a few days to mate and then return home. The second event was actually the background picture for this slide in which a new mother seen on the left with a very small calf was given a fish by a mother and calf pair from a different matriline within the same pod. This only suggests to me the strong social structure and culture of a pod. It is clear that prey sharing is an important part of the social and foraging ecology of the southern residents. If future studies were to target whales displaying foraging behaviors, then I truly believe we could answer more questions about the lives of this unique population. Scientists have been aware of the decline of the southern resident population for a while now, but important, important knowledge and data are still missing. This study only fills some of those gaps in our understanding of this endangered population, but we still need new technology, creative ideas, and resources so that this knowledge can help inform decision makers and the public to best aid in the recovery and the protection of these magnificent animals. Thank you. I'd especially like to thank my capstone committee that is here and Jeff Hard from the Northwest Science Center who um, definitely helped out with this species identification as well as all the other people that provided support and funding. Questions? Taylor, I just, I just want to say your name. <laughs> I was wondering um, uh, if you know from like acoustic data, you know, how much activity these animals have at night. You know, when you is this a daytime phenomenon? In other words, what you're seeing or that is a great question, and there's actually researchers I think looking into that this year in the summer seasons up in the Pacific Northwest. They're um, trying to or thinking about putting D tags on the whales at night to see what their activity is. But I can have someone smarter than me come find you during drinks and answer that question. <laughs> So you mentioned that you sorted through about 20,000 photos to get all the data that you used. Um, how many photos did you end up narrowing down to for foraging events? And then uh, more or less, how many um, photos are in each foraging event? Is it just one photo or are there like dozens? How does it break down? Uh, I'm embarrassed to know this, but from all the, for foraging events, there were 2,384 that were within those 29 foraging events. And of those, we had, I had one foraging event that only had two frames, but then I had another one that lasted like 12 minutes. So it would have been, it, the drone takes a picture every second for 12 minutes. So again, someone smarter can do that math for you. <laughs> was there any sense that the drone was disruptive in some of so the animal behavior? For instance, you know, the drone is kind of like a bird. And, you know, if you have this bird hanging around above you, you know, maybe that Yeah, for sure. Um, I tried to read everyone's minds, and I made question slides. So that's how you identify whales. That's where I found them. That's what fish look like. And so this is the picture on the left is the one that I used. And that was um, a picture of a drone being launched. But the picture on the right is actually what a drone looks like 30 meters above a whale. So 30 meters is there were no clear indication um, that the drone would bother these whales. Um, my other two advisors are sitting to your right, though, and you can ask them. <laughs> For instance, did you see any change of behavior as the drone would approach the animals or go over the animals? So, yeah, the drone approached from 30 meters. Um, the picture on the left, again, is the, the boat is 
greater than 200 yards away from the whales uh, when the drones launched. Um, but yeah, there was no, I don't think there's any evidence that the drone bothers the whales. Good question though. So a lot of flora and fauna are changing due to the changing climate and habitats. And you say that the southern residents mostly eat salmon from a specific watershed. And so in all of these photos that you've been looking through, have you noticed that they've eaten ty different types of salmon or types of fish or other food sources? Um, yeah, so there, I mean, as everyone knows, there's the killer whales are the top predator in the world's oceans. If anyone wants to argue it's sharks, I'll show, I'll show you some cool videos. Um, so there's, there's three kind of different types of orcas. There's the transients that eat the seals and the sharks that move around, and then there's residents that live in one certain area and specialize on a food source. So in the Pacific Northwest, it's salmon. In Iceland, it's herring. In Norway, it's herring. Um, so yeah, so for it's, it's been per, kind of hypothesized for a while, why are the southern residents specifically targeting Chinook salmon? Um, Chinook salmon are the biggest of the salmon species in the um, Pacific Northwest, um, and the Fraser River is kind of the biggest watershed there, so it's probably just um, the most pristine or the most available food source to them right now. Good question. Okay. I, he just really piqued my curiosity. Can you show us how you identify the different whales? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so or, all orca whales around the world have uh, distinguishing marks, especially behind their dorsal fin. This white patch is called a saddle patch, and it's kind of like a fingerprint on humans. So each one's, are, each one's different. Um, usually the photos are taken from the side from a boat, so you have a left and a right side. What's super awesome about the, um, the top-down images is that we can see both at one time. So you can kind of see, these are just four examples um, of different ones, so you can kind of see how they're all different. And Dr. Holly Fernback is here, and she's the one who made the whole catalog of the Southern and Northern Residents Identification Guide. 